So what we believe about the gospel, what we believe about God, what we believe about Jesus and what he did 2,000 years ago is what makes the church. Turn to the book of Acts. We're going to begin our our series through the book of Acts. We're going to go for about four weeks before we break for our Easter series. If you can think about that, Easter's coming up in just about eight weeks. All right, so we're going to be uh, talking about that. And then we're going to come back and hit um, uh, more of Acts after Easter. But uh, let's get started this morning by talking about foundations. Um, I'm not a builder, nor am I the son of a builder, okay? Um, so if you have something that needs built around your house, don't call me, okay? I'm just telling you right now, okay? It probably won't go well. However, I think argu- arguably you can say that the most important aspect of a building is its foundation. So if you, if you plan a building out, and you plan all of the elaborate designs of the building, the foyer, the rooms, um, all of the things inside the building, but the foundation isn't planned well. Does it really matter what the rest of the building looks like? If ultimately the foundation is weak, and if ultimately the foundation begins to crumble, does it matter how elaborate, how amazing you made the rest of the building? Does it matter what the rest of the building even looks like? If the foundation crumbles, what happens to the building? The building crumbles. It's the same with the church. It's the same with the church. If the church has a solid foundation upon which it is built, it will endure. You think about it. What organization, entity, company, movement has lasted and stood the test of time more than Jesus' church? 2,000 years of onslaught and persecution and difficulty and war and what still stands his church. Think about it. Today, across this globe, millions and millions of people met saying what? We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the resurrection. We believe that he conquered death, and we believe that he's coming back. That's the foundation upon which the church is built. It's a foundation that was laid 2,000 years ago, a foundation that has not crumbled, a foundation that is sure today. So this is what makes the church. It is not the buildings. It is not, it is not uh, the programs. It's not even the service. So, so what is a church? What is not a church? You know, a church isn't the programs we do. A church isn't even services that we hold. All right? The church is a people Right, so the church is a people called and chosen by God to be his people and participate in his mission. Let me say that again. The church is a people called out and chosen by God to be his people and to participate in his mission. And those people create a church. So tear down our, our, our buildings Remove the programs, the church still exists. And the church exists just because people come together and say, this is what we believe. We don't come together necessarily because we like one another or because we're very similar. In fact, there's a lot of diversity in this room. And that's what makes the church such an amazing place. There is so much diversity in this room, yet we can all come together and what and sing what? We believe. We believe this to be true. And it is upon those beliefs, upon that doctrine, that the church is then built. So the foundation of the church is really what we with one voice proclaim, this is what we believe. So while there's much that can divide us, and there are things that can divide us, what is of infinitely more value is the foundation upon which the church is built. And that's the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So as we begin the book of Acts, keep that in mind. This is the foundation of the church. So the book of Acts declares the acts of the apostles. The acts that the apostles did in those early days after Jesus' resurrection, in which this thing called the church began to emerge, all right, in Jerusalem was where it started and it began to spread out from there. The, the culture that the church um, took seed and root in was a turbulent culture. It was first century Roman Empire. 
Particularly in Jerusalem, there was a king named Herod who was, who, was, who was allowed to be king because the Romans allowed him to be king. So he was kind of a, a, a puppet of Rome a little bit, but, but, but had some control in the region of, of Israel there. Jesus had just completed a three and a half year ministry in which there was a lot of controversy. He claimed to be uh, the Messiah. He claimed to be the Son of God. It ultimately landed him um, on a cross. He was crucified. He was buried. And then all of a sudden, three days later, there was no body. So this Jewish carpenter from the northern regions of Israel called Galilee begins a movement, is crucified, is buried, and now there's claims that he rose again. So people are going around saying that Jesus was the Messiah, and he proved that because he rose from the dead. This was what was happening leading up to the book of Acts. Jesus took over 40 days, and in the flesh, in his resurrected body, he began to teach his disciples. So we pick up, we pick up that narrative in the book of Acts chapter 1. There was a man named Luke. Luke also wrote what? The book of Luke, yeah. You guys are so smart. There's Bible scholars out there. Luke wrote the book of Acts, and he wrote the book of Luke. So Luke writes, it says, the first book, O Theophilus, and so there's this, all of a sudden we're, we're introduced to this guy named Theophilus. Theophilus was most likely some sort of, of wealthy man who was, who was financing the research that Luke was doing to record the events of Jesus' ministry, in the book of Luke, and, and then the, the, the events of the, of the early church and the Acts of the Apostles, which is the book of Acts. So Luke, Luke is working probably for this guy Theophilus, and, he's, he, and, and, and Luke's going around. He's talking to individuals. He's going to eyewitnesses who were there. He's writing down the events that took place. He witnessed some of them himself. Luke was not an apostle, but Luke was doing, almost as a historian, this research, and, and, and Luke gives us the book of Acts so he's writing to a Theophilus. He says, in the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostle whom he had chosen. Verse 3, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many what? What's the word? The ESV says many proofs. The King James may use the word signs because the idea of many proofs. Appearing to them for 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And so what Luke does in beginning the book of Acts is he says, listen, before I give you the whole story of the church, let me give you the foundation of the church. And the foundation of the church is not a blue screen. There's demons in my... Well, you're just going to have to take my word for it this morning because my computer went black. I'm sorry, for those of you... Actually, as I was leaving the door today, I said, man, I, I, was, I put my PowerPoint together and I told my wife, I said, I said, I just... So many things go wrong with PowerPoint. I hate doing PowerPoint because I got the clicker up here and I got the computer down there and I am not a good multitasker. I'm like one, you know, and so if I got to worry about too many things. Um, but for those of you type A people that like to write things down, I will try and be clear for you this morning, okay? And if not, I will send you my notes. I will email them to you or give them to you, okay? So um, what we find out in the book of Acts, what we see is that, is that as, as Luke is preparing to record the foundation or the, or the story of the beginning of the church, he says, I wrote about what? About Jesus. Now that's significant because he says, what he's saying is, is, is point number one, that the foundation of the church is built on one thing. It's built on one person and his name is Jesus. Like all of the events of the book of Acts and all of the things that are going to take place from here to the end of the book of Acts, all of that has a foundation upon which it is built. The church does not exist without Jesus. The church is not built upon anything but Jesus. The church isn't built upon social reform. The church isn't built upon political reform. The church is built upon the teachings of Jesus and the person of Jesus. So the foundation of the church is Jesus. 
which is why the church has lasted for over 2,000 years and is going to continue to be around. So what, what is this foundation? First of all, these things that we proclaim that we believe, that Jesus came as the Son of God and lived a perfect life. We believe that. That's part of the foundation of the church. So when Luke says, I wrote to you all that Jesus began to do and teach, he's saying this is the foundation. Jesus is the foundation. I wrote to you all the things that Jesus did and the things that Jesus taught. Jesus came and lived a perfect life. Why was his perfect life necessary? Because you're not perfect. And we needed a substitute, someone who could keep the law of God perfectly for us where we failed. We believe that. That's the first layer of the foundation. Secondly is that he suffered and died in our place. Like the judgment of God that should have fallen upon you fell upon Jesus when he hung on the cross. So this righteous wrath that the Father has towards sin, which is a good and holy wrath, like an, like an actual anger and wrath towards sin, it, it was, it was pulled out, poured out in full measure upon Jesus when he hung on the cross. This, this is the foundation of the church. This is what brings us together. This is what creates the church, the fact that we believe this. The third thing is that he rose again in victory over sin and death. So he came as the son of God and lived a perfect life. He suffered and died in your place and he rose again in victory over sin and death. So why do we believe this? Why did the early church believe this? Because they had some sort of spiritual experience? Because it felt right? Because it, it, it promised a better life? Be honest with you, in the first century, being a Christian did not promise a better life, did it? Sometimes we have to, we have to divorce the, our view of American kind of evangelicalism because for the past 300 years in, in, in America, you know, we, we, there's been this Judeo kind of Christian ethic, which, by the way, is gone, okay? All right? It's no longer a popular thing. It's no longer um, a benefit to call yourself a Christian in, in our country, okay? But... For, for, for quite a few years there in America to be a Christian was, was, kind of, it was really accepted. It was, it was even in a sense um, expected in, in certain parts of the country. But in the first century, people didn't become Christians because it offered them a better life. People didn't believe in, in Jesus because, because it would somehow make their life easier. In fact, it made a lot of their lives a lot more difficult, especially those that were underneath the Roman persecution against Christians as, as, the, as the church began to grow and expand to the earth. So why did these people hold on to this teaching that ultimately brought them persecution and ultimately brought them great difficulty? Like, why did they hang on to it? Because as Americans, we, we kind of want to look for the easy road. Like, and a lot of what you hear with an evangelical Christianity is, 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 is Jesus will make your life better. Jesus will make your life easier. Come to Jesus and he'll take care of your problems. And that's just certainly not the case. I don't believe this because I, cause, cause it just gives me answers for, for what do I do with my life. I believe this. You know why? Because, because of what Luke wrote here. I believe in Jesus because I believe that he actually walked this earth 2,000 years ago. That he died on a Roman cross. That he was put into a grave. And I believe 100% that he rose from the dead. You know why? Because there was a guy named Luke that went to all the eyewitnesses and he had conversations with them. And they all told him the exact same thing. We saw him die. And we saw him raised. That's why he says for 40 days, verse 3, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. So Jesus specifically spent 40 days after his resurrected, resurrection proving in his resurrection. So the gospel in and of itself is something that's outside of us. It's not, it's not necessarily a personal experience. The gospel is, is, is the foundation that says 2,000 years ago in history, in time, in space, these events happened. So you can, you can claim that the church is full of hypocrites all you want, and you know what? You're probably right. You can, you can be mad at the church because you got hurt. 
All right, you can be mad at the church because you don't agree with their stance on this or that. But that has nothing to do with the fact that the foundation of the church is Jesus. Like, wh- like what I ask people who are like, oh, I, I, I'm not into organized religion. I'm not in- like, What do you do with Jesus? Like, what do you do with him? You have, to, you have to have a category to put him in. And so if you have eyewitnesses 2,000 years ago saying he was the son of God, he proved that through his miracles, we saw his power, we saw him die, and he proved that he was the son of God because he actually rose from the dead. Why do you think the apostles, I mean, just, just take Peter, for example. Peter, when Jesus was arrested, and then people came up to him and said, hey, you're, with, you're, you're from Galilee, you're with Jesus. What did Peter do? He, he denied Jesus how many times? Three times. He was a coward. And what we're going to find in Acts chapter 1 in a couple of weeks is Jesus gets up on the day of Pente- or Peter gets up on the day of Pentecost and preaches an incredibly courageous and potentially life-threatening message. So what changed with Peter? What made Peter go from coward to courageous? You know what it was? An encounter with the risen Jesus on the seashore one day where Jesus appeared to him and says, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. How do you explain the apostles going from cowards to these courageous men who transformed the world? Because they believed that Jesus rose from the dead because they saw him. Now Jesus says, blessed are you who have seen me. Blessed are those who believe and they have not seen me. That's us. But this isn't just some mystical belief in a guy who we... No, no, no. This is a belief in in, in actual events. The foundation of the church is a belief in actual events that took place 2,000 years ago. Now, what they mean for us in a spiritual sense, we're going to get into as we explore the book of Acts. So the foundation of the church we see is built upon Jesus, and that's what Luke is saying as he begins this. I wrote concerning Jesus and all of the things that he did, and I wrote about all of the things that he taught, so, so, and then I wrote about his resurrection and the proofs of his resurrection, so this is real. This can be built, uh, this is built upon eyewitness evidence. This is built upon something that is, is true and something that will last in the coming ages. So that's Luke saying, hey, the foundation of the church is Jesus. And then he goes on to say, he presented himself alive to them by many proofs, appearing to them for 40 days, speaking about the kingdom of God. And verse four, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. So this is Jesus telling the apostles and his followers, don't depart from Jerusalem because they were from Galilee, which is the northern section and Jerusalem was below Galilee. So he said, stay in Jerusalem. But to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so if we see, first of all, that the foundation was built upon Jesus, we see, second of all, that the mission of the church is given here in the book of Acts. So Jesus spends time talking about the promise of the Father. There's something coming. There's a promise coming. And that promise we find out is the Holy Spirit. We're going to get to that. So Jesus says, stay in Jerusalem. Stay here. And he he taught them. He taught them about his kingdom. And they're listening. And they come to him. And they said, in verse 9, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It's interesting because what Jesus was doing was preparing them to build the church. But where was their mindset? Earthly kingdom, wasn't it? Their mindset was still what it was as you read in the Gospels. 
their mindset was the Davidic rule being established or reestablished once again in Jerusalem, Rome being removed from rule in that region, and Jesus as the king sitting and ruling the earthly, that's what, that was their mindset. Their mindset wasn't, wasn't build the church, proclaim Jesus to the ends of the earth. Their mindset was build an earthly kingdom. But what we're going to see as we begin the book of Acts, this is the second point in the message, that the mission of the church is not to build an earthly kingdom, but to proclaim an eternal one. The mission of the church is not to build an earthly kingdom, but to proclaim an eternal kingdom. And so it's interesting the way Jesus answers because they're still thinking, now Jesus, now are you going to build up the Davidic rule here in Jerusalem? And, and, and Jesus gives this, gives them this very vague, um, very unhelpful answer, to be honest with you. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. He says, in a sense... Don't worry about that. Why? Because he says, but. But focus on this. He's about to give them their mission. Not an earthly kingdom, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll do what? You'll be my witnesses. And so Jesus proclaims that the mission of the church is to be his witness, to proclaim his eternal kingdom that was promised to Abraham thousands of years earlier. That would include people from every kindred tongue, people and nation. And so if our mission is to proclaim this eternal kingdom, to be his witnesses, we need help, don't we? Like, that's a big deal. Like, that's a big, audacious mission. Go take this message to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. But what is the promise that he gives his church before he gives them their mission? He says, you will what? Receive power. What fuels the church in its mission is the Holy Spirit's power. What gives us our power to accomplish the mission of being his witnesses and taking his name to the ends of the earth is the power of the Holy Spirit. So our focus is not build earthly kingdoms. Our focus is proclaim an eternal one. Jesus says you will do this when you receive power. And so he's promising them. It hasn't happened yet, but there is coming for them. And we're going to get to it in a couple weeks. This, this filling of the Holy Spirit. So what, like, what is that? Because in, in the church today, there's a lot of confusion about what the Spirit is. And how does the Spirit work? And we don't have time, my goodness, to get into all of that. But what I will say you, to tell you in a nutshell is when, a, when the Holy Spirit empowers a people, a church... What happens is this. The gospel is proclaimed without shame, with boldness. Like like when the Holy Spirit empowers us, we proclaim the gospel. When the Holy Spirit empowers us, people come to repentance. When the Holy Spirit empowers us, lives are transformed. When the Holy Spirit empowers us, disciples are made. When the Holy Spirit empowers us, faithfulness to the end, faithfulness to the grave is achieved. That only comes because the Holy Spirit invades our lives, empowers us to do his mission. So a church that is empowered by the Holy Spirit proclaims without reservation and with boldness the resurrection of Jesus and lives are changed, and people are saved. Addicts are set free, marriages are restored, and the next generation is risen up. We raise them up to continue it. I don't know about you, but I am so 
passionate about seeing the Holy Spirit power at work at Faith at Sellersville, that we would be a church that knows his power, that sees his power, that experiences power. Like it's been promised to us, hasn't it? Like we've been promised this power. And I want to see the power of the Holy Spirit change lives. I want to see the power of the Holy Spirit transform people. I want to see the power of the Holy Spirit save people. Like, like I want to see it reach into the darkness of our culture, like reach into the dark places and, and pull people out and give them hope. We've been promised this. We have this power. It's ours. And it changes lives. So if our mission is empowered by the Holy Spirit, we need to understand then that our mission is to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. So so Luke says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. This is what Jesus said to his disciples right before he was about to leave them. He says, be my witnesses and take it to the ends of the earth. This is why we focus on sharing Christ in our homes. We focus on sharing Christ in our neighborhoods. We focus on sharing Christ in our communities. We focus on sharing Christ through the ends of the earth. And we do that through missions. We do that through um, sending people out. This is our focus. This is our mission. And so Jesus says, build a, and proclaim, be a part of an eternal kingdom. Verse nine, lastly, when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing up into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So the last thing we see is that the promise of Jesus' return sustains our mission. Listen, church, those men stood there and they watched Jesus be lifted up in a cloud out of their sight. And I don't know what was going through their minds. I mean, I can just imagine the scene was like silence and like, Maybe fear, maybe uncertainty, maybe like, Jesus, we need you. We thought you were going to build this kingdom. What, what, what do we do now? Be my witnesses. And then they receive the greatest promise that the church can receive. This same Jesus that was taken up from you is coming back. Like he's returning. So you, you have this mission that I've given you. The foundation is built upon Jesus. Your mission is proclaim an eternal kingdom. But between now <laughs> and then, the promise that Jesus is coming back, boy, it, it could be difficult. And, and what we're going to see in the book of Acts is there's some difficult days for the church. There are some trying days But you know what? You know what sustains the church through the difficulty? What will sustain you in days of difficulty is this promise, this same Jesus. This same Jesus that that died and rose again. This same Jesus that was taken up from you will come back in the same way that he was taken. That the hope of the church is this, that there is a day coming No matter what happens in our country, listen, no matter who's elected, no matter who's elected in this next election, we have a promise to hold on to that our king is coming back, that we have a king who's eternal, that we have a king who loves us, and he's coming back, and he will come back in judgment, and he will come back and raise the dead, and that's the hope of the church that we look forward to, and that's what sustained these men on their days of difficulty. That's what gave them the motivation to press forward and to lay the foundation of the church upon which we stand today. This truth, your king's coming back. Whether it was Rome and Caesar 2,000 years ago, or it's our government today and our country today, We know that we have a king, and he's coming back. And this is what we want to fix our gaze upon. Father, as we think about the church, we want to thank you that you laid the foundation by shedding your blood. And Father, in this moment, 
I pray that we would all understand that the mission we have is to be your witnesses. And so I pray that in this moment, like right now, as we begin this series today, that Father, your Holy Spirit would empower us, that your Holy Spirit would rest upon faith at Sellersville, upon our leadership, upon our deacons, upon our servants, our volunteers, the people that come faithfully, those who give, Lord, that your Holy Spirit power would be ours, and that through that power, we would see people rescued from darkness, rescued from addiction, rescued from their lostness, rescued from the brokenness of their sin, that our Holy, the Holy Spirit would, would fill us, God, and empower us, and that as we proclaim an eternal kingdom, Father, I pray, please help us keep our eyes fixed upon you, fixed upon heaven, fixed to the skies, knowing that regardless of what happens to us or regardless of what happens in this country or in this world right now, that our King is coming back. Lord, help us to walk away with that confidence today. In Jesus' name, amen.